How do I even talk about this on YouTube? Oh my God, hey, welcome back to my stagey YouTube channel. If you're seeing my face for the first time, my name is Mickey Joe, and I'm obsessed with all things theater. Musicals, plays, the occasional bit of mime. Okay, that was a lie. But I was lucky enough to very recently get to go and see the press night performance of one of the most anticipated new play revivals currently happening in the West End. This is the star-studded revival of Cock. The provocatively titled play from Mike Bartlett, which debuted at the Royal Court over a decade ago. It is now being revived in the West End at the Ambassadors Theatre by legendary director Marianne Elliott, with huge stars Jonathan Bailey, soon to be starring in the second season of Bridgerton, Taron Egerton, as well as Jada Nuka and Phil Daniels. Now, full disclosure, because I like to be honest about these things, I was not actually invited to review this play. I was lucky enough to be at the press night performance because I was a guest of another friend of mine, the wonderful Daz Gale, who runs the blog All That Dazzles. If you haven't already, go and read his blog. He gives you all of the reviews for all of the shows and sees much more theater than I do, which if you didn't know that was possible, turns out, yes it is. Now, before I get into it and let you know what I thought about the play, I am going to be giving away this souvenir program. This program has information about the cast and the creative team. It has a whole page defining uh, some modern LGBTQ plus terminology. We also have some lovely broody photos of the cast, including Jonathan Bailey and Taryn Edgerton, if that's, if that's what you're going for. And I'm going to be doing a Mickey Joe giveaway of this program. All you need to do to be in with a chance of winning is to make sure that you have subscribed to my channel, liked this video and commented down below with hashtag Mickey Joe giveaway. If you head over to my Instagram and Twitter pages, there will also be posts there for you to share in order to gain an extra entry into the giveaway competition. If you do win, however, you just may want to be aware while opening your mail because that's questions will be asked about this. That's a conversation starter right there. When my mother asked me if I had any shows coming up, I simply lied. So I enjoyed this play, I really did. It's an objectively powerful piece of theater. It, you know, it's written very well, it is performed incredibly, it is staged very capably. This is theater done well. This is clearly writers and directors and creatives and performers at the top of their game, and it takes huge creative swings. However, sometimes, even when the work is objectively very good, you just don't connect with it as an individual. And I think this is much of what happened to me here, because I can't bring myself to give this play more than four stars. I felt like it had a lot of possibility that wasn't explored, and not all of the choices that were made creatively worked for me. I thought about giving this a three star. It's a low four for me. It would be unfair to call it a three, and that would only reflect my disappointment in hoping it was going to be this amazing blockbuster evening, because I have big expectations when it comes to the work of Marianne Elliott. So Marianne Elliott, if you don't know, she directed Angels in America at the National Theatre, also War Horse, also The Curious Instant of the Dog in the Nighttime. I've enjoyed a lot of Marianne Elliott's work. I feel like right now especially, she's at the top of her game. I mean, she is the one who brought Patti Lapone out of musical theatre retirement. Hello. That kind of charity work should not go unnoticed. She's a brilliant, brilliant director, and I think this is still a very good direction here that some of the choices didn't pay off for me. And I don't know if perhaps I'm just getting bored of some of the tropey theatre things I keep seeing in plays. I don't know that we still need to have soundscapes with flashing lighting cues with actors going, oh, in between scenes and scene changes. And I don't know what value there is in having actors walk around each other and pretend to be touching when they're not and like do these sort of weird interpretive dance contemporary movement things in an otherwise very naturalistically acted play. I don't know that I gained anything from the entire play being staged within what looks like the inside of a jet engine. The entire set is just mirrored floors and walls and this one revolving door that kind of looked like you were entering Croydon Ikea and at one point spun so fast that the stage manager had to come on and grab it. And there's a turntable in the middle which is used to great effect. I mean, there's some brilliant moments in this play. Staging wise, I just don't know if I appreciated the fact that no one touched each other. I mean, this is a play about intimacy and about love and about relationships and identity and sexuality. And so much of that comes from believing the relationships that are being portrayed on stage. And it's very hard to do that when you don't let them touch each other. You know, it's really interesting to see a play that was written, I think, in something like 2008 or 2011. I should fact check myself on this. <laughs> 
Oh, and the hardest part about this is you can't Google the name of the play, nor can you Google the name of the play followed by the word play because <laughs> those are both different Google searches. 2009, there you go. So it's interesting to see a play that was written in 2009 have such a dialogue and have such a relevance with conversations that are really being had today and certainly weren't being had in 2009. The way that we have conversation about gender identities and about relationships that transcend sexuality and binary understandings of both gender and sexuality is very interesting. So in many ways ahead of its time, but at the same time, because of that, I think a lot of the dialogue that it presents and the discourse that it presents is to a certain extent dated and it feels like we've had much bigger conversations than the conversations being had in the play. It feels like it's knocking at a door that has long since been opened and everyone is already inside talking about the possibilities. Cock really only begins to ring the doorbell of the conversation around gender and sexuality. So I think it's fair to say that I was disappointed. So the performances are really what I want to talk about here because they are all noteworthy in their own ways. Let's start with Jonathan Bailey, who does not leave the stage during this performance. It's very much about his character. He is the only named character in the play, fittingly named John. So if you don't want spoilers, skip this next part. I'm gonna give you a little bit of context as to his narrative in the play. So we meet John in a relationship with his boyfriend. It's a strained relationship. It is not perfect. This ends and he subsequently meets someone else. This someone else that he meets happens to be a woman and he has an unexpected connection with her and they then develop a very unexpected sexual relationship because he still identifies as a gay man. Jonathan Bailey is especially quirky as this character. You know, we meet him as someone very much in the throngs of an identity crisis and he describes being very different people when he's in the company of each of his partners and he portrays that duality very well. He is a rare breed of actor that can play comic and ridiculous that well and still have a seriousness and a charm and a sincerity to him as a more classical romantic leading man. So he's a really great fit for this play. It is not his fault that I hated his character. Oh, did I hate his character. And he was starting to grow on me because he is very endearing and he was really doing his best to try and make this person likable. But my God, especially towards the end of the play, he's just obnoxiously awful. <laughs> you know, it's a bold move to make the lead of your play that odious. Taron Edgerton I very much enjoyed. Specifically in the middle is where I really enjoyed his characterization. He had these fantastic barbs when he first gets to meet the woman in his boyfriend's life uh, because she's been invited over for dinner in this very awkward, very Harold Pinteresque dinner party situation. And the way that he greets her with nothing but utter camp contempt is brilliantly funny and just acidic in the best possible possible way. He shows a lovely vulnerability throughout the second half of the play as well and has some legitimately really nice moments. Jade Anuka gives a fascinating performance as the female character in the play. She presents this incredibly original and incredibly unstereotypical other woman who exists not as a sort of a symbol of absolute femininity or of anything that's really been portrayed before as far as I've seen. She is just an individual of a quite interesting and unique individual who has this connection with this person and I think the humanity of that is what is emphasized which I find really interesting. Phil Daniels does very well with the small amount of material that he has. I don't understand the need for his character and I would much rather he didn't exist. There are some funny moments thanks to his being there but I think the whole thing would be stronger as a three-hander and I think there are things that are being explored that stop being explored when he arrives. I feel like it just kind of stunts the development of the tension in the narrative. So the absolute highlight of this play is definitely this moment we get towards the end of it where these four characters are having a very tense outdoor dinner party and sort of taking turns making big speeches and the whole thing devolves into a cockfight hence the name of the play. We see them slowly turning around on this central turntable. It's a brilliant bit of staging. I love anything where a turntable is going to slowly turn for a long time. The insight that it physically gives you to the shifting perspective of the situation and the way that it forces you to check in separately with each of the characters and consider things from other perspectives. I mean, I don't know that you're meant to root for either of the relationships here. I think as it progresses, it's difficult really to want any of these people to have happiness. It certainly it certainly becomes hard to see why they're fighting over Jonathan Bailey's character. But that was very much my favourite part of the play. It is also worth saying, a lot of people I was there with really loved this play, have booked to see it multiple times, 
and are really excited about it. And I think there's an awful lot to enjoy about this. If you're a Jonathan Bailey fan, if you're a Taron Egerton fan, you are going to enjoy this play because they perform brilliantly and they have some really crowd-pleasing moments. Taron Egerton has some great lines. Jonathan Bailey is hilarious throughout. This is good date night theatre, but you know, just be aware of the status of your relationship and the questions it might cause you to ask each other afterwards, because there's an awful lot of dialogue about ending relationships and evolving relationships and what makes relationships work and what makes them bad. This is good date night theatre for a very specific time in your relationship when you are wanting to have those kinds of conversations, and not if you're in another time in your relationship when you're very much not wanting to have those conversations. This is not first date theatre. This might be like eighth date theatre. It is not particularly explicit. I mean, they make reference to body parts, but it's really in more of a biological sense than a passionate one. There's also a physical intimacy scene portrayed on stage, but again, it really comes across more scientific than anything else. This was my first time going into the Ambassadors Theatre, and it is small. If I was to make a list of theatres that need some sort of an urgent redesign and remodelling of their interior, the Ambassadors Theatre is definitely high up on my list because the whole experience was a little bit claustrophobic. I just think rather than having a fairly unremarkable and tiny standard proscenium space, you could do something much more interesting with it and make it a more interesting West End located space for smaller shows shows to transfer from venues like the Southwark Playhouse, like other regional venues. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed my review of this play. Don't forget to comment down below with hashtag Mickey Joe giveaway for your chance to win an exclusive souvenir program. Also, to read a completely different opinion of this play, head over to allthatdazzles.co.uk and read my good friend Daz's five-star review. He loved it very much. Go check out what he has to say. He worked very hard on those cock puns. Oh, I just did one. Oh, that wasn't even intentional. They just keep... Ca I'm going to stop myself. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to my Stager YouTube channel where there is plenty more content coming very, very soon. I am seeing lots of shows coming up. I've already seen things that I need to sit down and film videos about. Honestly, I am drowning in the amount of content that I am about to bring to you. And if you have already seen Cock at the Ambassadors Theatre, I am talking specifically about the play, get your minds out of the gutter. Then let me know in the comment section what you thought about it. And finally, if you want to support me as a Stagey content creator, head over to patreon.com forward slash Mickey Joe Theatre where for a variety of membership tier options, you can gain access to a bunch of behind the scenes content from my theatre going, as well as some exclusive photos and videos. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my God, hey. Thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe. <laughs>